went wrong. Howdy, howdy. Look at me. <laughs> Welcome on I'm in. guy who knows what went wrong. <laughs> to the free show before the free show where the train's just yeah. on the tracks. That's right. Things are going great. My chair. Was somebody sitting in my chair? Yeah. I'm really low. Who was sitting in my chair? Well, I was sitting there yesterday. You for a brief you amount of time. Monster. Oh no! You know who put it down? I bet. Who's that? Powers. But he was there before mm. yesterday. Maybe you just didn't realize that it was low yesterday. Maybe. I don't I'm gonna know. blame it on Powers. I'm much, uh, much taller now. Um, um, hello. Hi. I do have a story. Okay. If you don't have anything. Let's go to a story. Um. So the other day it was Sunday. So mm-hmm. we get back from State 7 on 7 on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, edited some videos, passed out. Then the next morning, I was... You know, w- a party or what? Yeah, no kidding. And the next day, I was... Er, like, that night, I was going, you know what? I should probably stay out of the sun for a day because, like, I still internally felt like I was, like, a thousand degrees hot. My friend, that's how I feel all the time. <laughs> Why don't you stay out of the sun? <laughs> Seems good. <laughs> But I woke up the next day and I was like, okay, it's gorgeous out. Like, the temperature was really nice that next day. I'm going to go get a few laps in the pool in before it gets hot. So I'll be in the sun, but it won't be too bad. So I go to the pool and everything's going great. I'm out there for, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. And then I'm like, okay, it's time to go go destroy some breakfast now. Okay. So as I'm leaving, I realize I'm the only person at the pool. Mm-hmm. And... They have, like, rent-a-cops out there on the weekend to make sure that, like, people are wearing the bands that they're supposed yeah. to be wearing, blah, blah, blah. And so as I'm leaving, the rent-a-cop looks at me, and he goes, can I get your help with something? And I was like, well, sure, what can I help you with? There were baby ducklings stuck in the pool. Oh. So Mama Duck was big enough to get out of the pool, but there was just this little ledge that the baby ducks weren't strong enough to get themselves out of there. Oh, my gosh. So he was like, I can't get in the water because he's in his rent-a-cop suit. And he was like, is there any way you can help me? Because anytime he tried to go over to the ducklings, Mama Duck would dive into the water, and then they would all swim around. So long story short, I am sitting there and I'm like, okay, sure. So I get back in the water and I am chasing around three baby ducklings. Oh my gosh. And Mama Duck is leading the thing and she's quacking at me. Finally, I was able to get two ducklings in one hand and one duckling in the other hand and grab them out of the pool. And then Mama Duck comes chasing after me. I'm like, oh man, I'm about to get bit by this duck. And anyway, I rescued... The baby ducklings. But wow. it was quite the adventure. Wow, I'm like running you. around the pool like this trying to pick up these ducks. <laughs> what, a, what a bizarre life you lead. Just like gen- <laughs> generally. Like, I think you leave a pretty bizarre life. Yeah, I felt like it was a pretty on-brand story. But the rent cop was like, thanks so much. And I was like, yeah, no problem. Like yeah. I just spent 10 minutes. Like I can only imagine people like watching from their balconies. Like what is this crazy blonde chick doing down there? And I'm like running around trying to chase these ducks. And you were out laying out by the pool when this happened? I was leaving the pool when this happened. Like, I was leaving, and he was like, before you go. So then I had to, like, re-dry off and everything. I was going to say, yeah. There's a lot of, that's not just running around and chasing a duck. It was not convenient. Like, it was not convenient by any stretch. I was out there for about ten minutes trying to chase these ducks. But the baby ducklings got back to Mama, Mm. and, but she was, she was not happy with me. She did not like the fact that I was picking up the baby ducklings. Let me tell you something. And I'm certainly not equating the two. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you that I feel like I would be a pretty decent duck chaser <laughs> because I have a two and a half year old. That, yeah. Like, the like I think you look at me and you go, this guy, he's not very quick. He's not very agile yeah. or anything like that. But I also have, I have dad agility. Dad agility. <laughs> I do. Well, and that's and, the thing. And like, so I'm I'm quick whenever, like, my kid's running out into traffic. I'm like, right. Whoop, 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 nope. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the other thing is, like, obviously moving around that quickly in water is kind of a feat. Like, mm-hmm. it's not like I was chasing mm-hmm. them on land. Like, 
sitting there trying to wade through the water and I also didn't know I was like man are they gonna have like are they gonna cut up my hand when I try to pick like I can That's honestly say I'd never picked up a duck before and so I'm like <laughs> I don't know if they have like little for tuning paws in, in the end. This is every podcast is somebody's first if this is your first welcome and the first thing you heard was like you know I've heard such good things about this Texas football today <laughs> I, maybe I'll watch them live today I'll tune it in you know I've never been I don't know if a duck's gonna cut my <laughs> hand up whenever I pick it up I can honestly say I've never picked up a duck I can honestly before. Say a cross stitch that on a throw pillow. <laughs> That'd be great. Anyway, that's how I spent my Sunday. You know. Rescue. It's like like a firefighter rescuing a cat, but it was me. Yeah, except not at all in any duck. way. Like a a those are professionals. Uh, you know, I B, was, it was a cat. incredibly heroic of myself. Oh, may I say? <laughs> got it. All right, hit the theme expo. Let's go! Free money! Free money! <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> Football today, a program coming to you because you paid your internet bill. My name is Greg Tupper. I'm the managing editor of Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, TexasFootball.com, a corresponding website. Thank you for spending part of your day with us. Whether you're watching us live at TexasFootball.com, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch, or you listen to us on the podcast, which you can subscribe to on the podcast vendor of your choice. Either way, thank you for doing your part to support your local mediocre internet show. I'm sitting here, sitting over there at the helm today, making us sound good, steering this ship away from the icebergs as she can, as best she can. She's the Duchess of the Dork. She's Ashley Pickle. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no That's icebergs around here. Is. That's all this job is, is that, steering it away from icebergs. Yep. We had to run to the – we went to the – long story short, Hank had a haircut this morning, so mm -hmm. I took him to get a haircut. And then afterwards, after the haircut, we always go to a park near our house. Yes. And it was the first time I've ever heard him say – it's hot. I want to go home. And I'm like, you are my kid. You are my kid. <laughs> that whole stand out of the sun thing is going to carry on a stinks, uh, generation. That's right. Today is Thursday, July 1st, 2021. That's right. Welcome to July, folks. 147 right. days till Thanksgiving. Happy birthday to Missy Elliott. Yes, um, 50 today. Is she 50? Yep. I I haven't seen her. I haven't I haven't heard her lately. Mm -hmm. Bet she can still go. Oh, yeah. That girl rules. Um, it's funny. The reason I knew that is because when you said you might not make it here on the show on time, I looked at birthdays, and I was like, there's not many good. Missy Elliott, that's Never the mind. one. <laughs> Episode 1196. On today's show, guys, we're going to talk, continue our series of State of the Program addresses. This one, we're going to talk with the man with the plan, the man in charge, the big man over at Horn Frog Blitz. Talk a little TCU with Jeremy Clark coming up here in the moment. In the back half of the program, we've got a couple of seven-on-seven -seven interviews. We're going to hear from Brian Gibson of Wink, and we're going to hear from El Paso America's coach, Patrick Meltzer. Is that right? Yep, that's right. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, that was too long to fit in the bar ah, down there. Got it. <laughs> Had to shorten it up. That checks out. Do we have first four through the door? We sure do. It was Aaron Arbuckle, John McNeil, Andrew Christensen, and some lady named Trisha Pickle. Ooh. Welcome in, fellas and lady fellas. Welcome in, fellas and lady fellas. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you about this, guys. Yeah. You may Here, I'll notice, take this down. You may notice my excellent shirt. You uh -huh. may notice Pickle's excellent hoodie. That's right. From your couch to the tailgate, Home Field Apparel makes the best game day and everyday gear. As part of their big new Saturday campaign, revealing new schools for 16 straight weeks, the Texas and Texas A&M collection were announced in June and are now available on their site, homefieldapparel.com. Oh, we have some more gear. And let me tell you, they are comfy. It doesn't matter oh, if, whether it's dude. the sweatshirt or the shirts. Everything is pristine softness. A and M gear. Big yeah. fan of Sarge. Bi yeah, big you Sarge energy. If you don't like Sarge, can't be friends. Uh, let's see. I like this one. It's a little old. Like they, it's like I, I don't know. This is not in the copy points, but it's like all their stuff is like super vintage and it's mm -hmm. awesome. So um, they have, by the way. Uh, they were the presenting sponsor of the cover reveal, by the way. And so if you want to show them a little bit of love, go over to homefieldapparel.com. Uh, if you are a Texas college football fan, 
Uh, the, here are the collections that they have. They have Baylor, Houston, Houston Baptist, Rice, SMU, Texas, Texas A&M, and Texas Tech. Uh, and they're going to be revealing more. And by the way, one of my favorite things, and this is this, I think this will jive with what everybody already thinks of me. Mm-hmm. What I want is just like a random college shirt. Yes. Like, because these shirts are super comfortable. They they fit really well for me. Um, you know, I think they fit really well for everybody. Yes. And I want like a Belmont shirt. I was thinking to say like you, you know? don't have to stick with. Oh, the, let me look at this. The A and M or Texas. Oh, pickle. They're obviously great. Pickle, you know what they've got? What? They've got the troops. They do have the troops. They have army. They do have the There's troops. Their you army could, stuff you rules. Get a troop shirt. Ooh, ooh. I'm about to spend some money on homefieldapparel.com, and you should too. Homefieldapparel.com, uh, of course, the pr- presenting sponsor of our cover reveal and the presenting sponsor of that's why we're wearing this gear today. So uh, homefieldapparel.com to go and check that stuff out. We have to make sure we, we represented both sides of the rivalry too. we got Texas and Texas A&M uh, represented, and they both revealed here in June as part of their big new Saturday thing. So te- uh, homefieldapparel.com, thank you, Homefield Apparel, uh, for uh, everything that you do uh, to help make comfortable vintage college shirts because uh, they rule. Good stuff. And by the way, we've got some we've got some um, some giveaways I think going on on social media. So check that out. We're giving away some home field apparel swag. So if you go check that out on our social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, etc. <coughs> I'm looking at Pickle for the cue. Oh, she gave me a thumbs up. Pickle, let's go to the hotline. We're continuing our series of state of the program addresses. Uh, taking a look at the 12 FBS programs in the state of Texas, we have arrived in Fort Worth, America. Cowtown. To talk a little bit about them horned frogs. And who better to talk to about the horned frogs than Jeremy Clark over at Horned Frogs, Horn Frog Blitz, part of the 24 7 Sports Network. Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing great. How's everyone over there? We're doing fantastic. Just gearing up for a little bit of football. I know you guys are uh, as well. Uh, appreciate your time today. When, when we talk about TCU, uh, this is a program that I think finished really strong last year uh, and, and I think got better as the season uh, went along. Um, but obviously, you know, a 6-4 and four record, that's not kind of the, the, the usual excellence that we've come to just really expect every year from, from uh, TCU, especially under Coach Gary Patterson. I'm interested from your perspective. I know this is a bit of a broad question, but what do you think is the state of the TCU program right now? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we, we really are trying to figure it out ourselves because if you look at the last um, three seasons, they, they haven't really played up to par. Um, two seasons of back-to-back sub, subpar seasons in, in uh, 2019 and, and obviously 2018. Like you said, they, they started to win some games late in the year. Last year won five out of six. But I think for the most part, this is going to be a make-or-break year. And I'm not saying Gary Patterson's on the hot seat or anything, but – I think TCU fans in general are kind of getting impatient with uh, some of the direction of the program. Where's the offense headed? Uh, defense is always going to play well, but I think with this year, it, the optimism's high right now. I, when you look at the Big 12 preseason rankings, I think you're going to see them somewhere in the top three or four, but it's it's kind of a make-or-break season for them right now. I think TCU fans in general are kind of tired of seeing that six, win, six wins and seven wins every year. Well, and you take a look at, at kind of what the offense uh, looked like last year and, and kind of going into 2021, you know, Doug Meacham is now uh, pretty much entirely in, in control of the TCU offense. And and he, he seems to have certainly some very exciting pieces around them. You know, in, in a state where there's not a lot of stability at the quarterback spot, TCU's got a guy in Max Duggan that I know they feel pretty good about, uh, plus a, a really interesting and deep uh, stable of running backs out there. Um I guess on the offensive side, let's focus a little bit on Doug Meacham for a moment. Do you anticipate what what do you think is going to be different maybe about this offense with Doug Meacham kind of taking the controls in a full time capacity? Well, if you look back to 2014 and 2015, what what a lot of people remember about TCU, they love going vertical, they love going high pace, and that's really what Doug wants to run. Doug will run five verticals at you if he can. And if you look over there at TCU's roster on offense right now, they've got a ton of weapons at receiver. Uh, they got three really good slots and uh, Tay Barber, Darius Davis, and J.D. Spillman, and a good outside guy in Quentin Johnson. I think last year he led the Big 12 in average yards per catch. So he's going to want to get downfield. Uh, obviously, he wants his running uh, quarterbacks to run the ball a little bit, which anyone that's watched TCU football realizes that Max Duggan has 
Um, some really good wheels, probably the fastest quarterback in the Big 12. And I think if you look at the running backs, Zach Evans is arguably one of the top running backs in the Big 12. He showed what he could do really in the last three games of the season, rush for 100 yards in two of those games. But Doug's going to want to move the ball. He's going to want to go high pace, and he's going to want to put a lot of points on the board. And if you look at the, the quarterback position, speaking of Max, mm-hmm. this is really the first year since 2017 when Kenny Hill was a senior that TCU's going into a season with a quarterback that has at least two years of experience under his belt. Max is going into his third year as a starter, so – that's a that's a that's a big thing for TCU's offense moving forward right now. Do you think that in the sticking with Duggan here for a moment, um, you know, I I I think he's one of the more underappreciated quarterbacks there in in the conference at least, and and, and maybe if you want to zoom out in in the nation, a guy who probably I think because they haven't put up those big gaudy numbers doesn't necessarily get the the, the credit that he deserves. But but overall, what is the what is the TCU fan base's feel for for Max Duggan do they feel like hey we've got a guy and we got a guy who can go and lead us uh, up up towards the top of the Big 12 I don't want to say it's split down the middle but it, it's pretty close I think a lot of fans realize Max is a very athletic quarterback they want to see more consistency out of his uh, throwing ability he hasn't been extremely accurate uh and, and the other quarter the other fans they think Max is the next calling at quarterback for TCU. They feel like he's going to be one of the best to ever wear the TCU uniform. Uh, We've seen, we've seen some flashes from him. We've seen some great games against Texas. Uh, For whatever reason, he plays really good against the Longhorns. It gives a lot of fans optimism looking forward, but he's also taken a lot of unfair criticism. He's, he's uh, running for his life. Most of the time, if you look at TCU's offense, the last couple of years, they've struggled up front and, uh, a lot of the listeners that, that are listening right now, they understand a quarterback can't throw the football if he's trying to throw from his back. So mm-hmm. it's one thing uh, to criticize Max, but you also got to look at the offensive line in front of him. And I think right now, uh, looking at TCU's offensive line, what they got returning, they're going to be more experienced up front. They feel confident about the group. And obviously with Max going into his third year, they're going to feel a little bit more confident throwing the ball this year. Talking TCU with Jeremy Clocker of Horned Frog Blitz here on Texas Football Today. Get involved in the conversation with hashtag TF Today. Of course, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, talk about uh, where TCU's bread is buttered, which is on the defensive side. Uh, and this is a... This strikes me as a unit that could be ready for its close-up. Even though they lose, you know, I think I think there's a lot of programs across the nation that they're to lose guys like Trevon Morig or, or, or Garrett Wallow or, or, or Darius Washington. It would be rebuilt on the defensive side. That doesn't seem to be the case on the TCU defense. Um, you know, Travis Todges Tomlinson looks, looks outstanding, looks like he could be the next big thing. Uh, is it fair to expect this to be a an excellent borderline elite TCU defense because from where I sit I think that they've certainly got the pieces in, in, in play to be one of the very best in the Big 12. I've been around them since 05 and and, and I could say without question this is one of the more athletic defenses I've seen mm-hmm. them have. Uh, they've got a lot of pieces coming back. They did lose Garrett. They li- did lose Merrick uh, but in, in Ardarius Washington but Anytime they have Gary Patterson walking the sidelines over there calling that defense, I tell everyone they're going to be they're going to be fine on defense. Uh, athletically, the defensive ends that, that they have, O'Shawn Mathis and Kari Coleman, are two of the better defensive ends in the Big 12. Uh, both of them were in the top three in tackles for loss. I think Mathis ended up finishing second in sacks. Uh, I think Kari Coleman's going to have a really big year in his true sophomore season coming up. And interior line, the interior defensive line that they have, and I've always told people about this with Gary Patterson's defense. Anytime they have a very strong defensive line, the rest of the defense just excels. Mm-hmm. And their interior defensive tackle position, they've got eight deep at that at that position. Wow. It's probably the, the, the most experience I've ever seen them have at that position in, in all my years covering them. Uh, Terrell Cooper was a, a kid out of Lindell, Texas, very under-recruited. He's, he's uh, excelled at his uh, position at TCU. Corey Bethley's another guy that has excelled. Young guys like Patrick Jenkins, he's he really came onto the scene last year as a freshman, but they're they're really strong up front. Linebacker's going to be fine, as you mentioned. D. Winters is another kid in the Big 12 that made a lot of great plays. And if you ask some TCU fans last year, they might have felt that D. Winters actually played better than Garrett Wallow in some of those games. And Hodges Tomlinson, I mean, what a great story he is. Nephew of Ladanian came in came in as a safety out of Waco Midway. He's transitioned into corner, become one of the best corners in the nation, but 
One guy I'll, I'll mention too, and a lot of people forgot about him, was Noah Daniels. Noah mm-hmm. Daniels was actually playing better than Hodges Tomlinson uh, through the first three games of the season before he got injured against Oklahoma. So they're going to be really strong at corner uh, at starter. They got to find a little bit more depth there, but. Overall, on defense, I think they're going to be pretty special. Uh, final question for Jeremy Clark of Horn Frog Blitz. Uh, he joined us here talking about TCU football. Um, I, I look at TCU, and, and this is, I think, in, in a lot of ways, from a from a national perspective, uh, it's a bunch of you know guys that I know that you you're excited about. I'm excited to see on Saturdays, but maybe aren't they don't necessarily have that like headliner. That guy who's gonna who who says, "Oh, TCU, that's where so and so plays." I think Max Duggan's a really good player. I, I like guys like Quentin Johnston and stuff, and especially on that defensive side. Although they've always kind of been kind of a some of their parts type defense. I want you to. I'm gonna put you on the record here on July 1st, which is not fair. Uh, give me a, give me a guy we're gonna be talking about uh, at the end of the season and be like, "Man, how did I not see him coming as such a star on this TCU team?" Who's who's the guy you've got your eye on uh, as the breakout star for this TCU team? Oh, gosh, that's a, that's a great question. I would say out of the guys that really no one talks about, and he plays a position that uh, another guy is more talked about, uh, Zach Evans, everyone talks about him because he's a five-star. But the, the kid I keep hearing great things about this summer is Kendra Miller. Uh, Kendra Miller was a two-star out of tiny Mount Enterprise in East Texas, and, and he, he really broke onto the scene last year as a freshman. Um, didn't have as many yards as Darwin Barlow or, or Evans, but he was a guy that ran extremely hard. And you just talk to the people around TCU. They're really excited about what he's going to be able to do this year. And obviously with Barlow leaving for L- – uh, I'm sorry, for USC, he's going to get more touches. So Kendra Miller would be the kid that I would keep an eye out for to, to have a big season for the Frogs. Well, and that actually you know dovetails into, into another question because Kendra Miller kind of strikes me as that, that quintessential Gary Patterson recruit, right? Small town. Yeah under recruited but we see something we think he can make him a star it, you know i know that obviously things have changed uh for for tcu and they're able to get you know four four star guys more regularly and stuff like that but but from a recruiting perspective you know how much of the identity for tcu is still those hidden gems where they they really made a name for their program under gary patterson how much of it is still the, those kind of guys that we see something in that maybe other programs don't well, you're right. They're, they're, they have changed the landscape as far as recruiting goes. They're, they're able to get those five- and four-star players now uh, more than what they were probably about 10 years ago. But they still rely on their bread and butter, and that's, that's finding those guys that are the under-the-radar recruits. Ty Summers, two-star kid. Jerry Hughes was a two-star kid. Kendra Miller, two-star kid. And, and they're always going to find those kids. It's, it's crazy because I tell people a lot of times, it's like Gary Patterson sits in his office with this crystal ball. He can look at a player that might be a – 6'2", 200-pound safety, and he envisions a linebacker making plays in the Big 12. He envisions this kid becoming 215 to 225 once he gets on campus, maintaining the speed and being able to make plays. And, and, and really, it's it's a, a tip to the hat to the whole coaching staff over there because they do a great job of evaluating talent and finding those kids. Deshaun McQuinn is going to have a chance to start at free safety for them. The only other offer that he had out of, out of Jacksonville, Texas, was McNeese State. Mm-hmm. And th- you're talking about a kid that uh, right now is 6'1", 200 pounds, looks rock solid, and he has a chance to be competing as starting free safety for perhaps the best defense in the Big 12. So uh, that's that's the kind of diamonds in the rough they find, and uh, I don't think they're ever going to change that as long as Gary's around there. He's Jeremy Clark. You can find his fine work at Horn Frog Blitz, uh, part of the 24-7 uh, Sports Network. Uh, Jeremy, we really appreciate your time. Thanks for your insights, and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Hey, appreciate everything you guys do. Absolutely. There he goes. Jeremy see Clark, hornfrogblitz.com. Don't tell him see ya like your yeah. friends. I know Jeremy. I know you like Jeremy. You told, <laughs> I told you I booked Jeremy. You're like, he's good people. I like him. I said Jeremy. He's good people. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, uh, I- exciting times for TCU. Uh, pick up the magazine, 2021 Summer Edition of Dave Campbell's Text Football, and you will see that we are rather high on TCU. Yeah. We think they could be. And he mentioned it. You know, it's been a couple of years. They've kind of slid off that kind of front doorstep of the of the Big 12, I think. Very 500. 2018, 2019, just not to their standards. 20, yeah. 2020, you know, 2020, I ball up and throw in the trash for right. every team, basically. You know what I mean? Well, they but, really picked up the momentum after that OU mm-hmm. game. They mm-hmm. it, That didn't go well, and then they started with the Baylor game and won five out of their next six. Won I mean, f- five out of there, six. They stumbled you know? at w- West Virginia, but, I mean, you're talking about a team that if they if they, if they if they do what they should have, and I think they just slept walked into Morgantown, right. basically. If they do what they're talking about, then they're 7-3, and three, 
mm-hmm. and and they're and they've won their last six, including Oklahoma State, you know, things like that. And then you know, I think they are. I think their perception and the narrative around TCU is unfortunately shaped because of COVID, mm-hmm. like a slow start. Yep. Like, don't get me wrong. There's no excuse to go lose to Kansas State at no. home. Like, that's a bad loss. I'm not here to, to defend them. But like, between that, and then also, they had the Texas Bowl canceled. Yep. I, I think they would have beaten Arkansas, in yep. my opinion. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, whenever T- an SEC team finishes them at 7-4, and four, and suddenly things look a little bit brighter. You just, so I think that's a team that maybe people are sleeping on a little bit. You just can't depend on Max Duggan to do everything. That's the biggest we thing. We said it 8,000 times last year, and it's the same thing. This He's he's old faithful, and he's a good quarterback, but he's not the overridden superstar that can go single-handedly take over a game. Just don't yes. ask him to do too much, and you're fine. Most certainly. So, appreciate Jeremy Clark from Horn Fl- Frog Blitz. I want to make sure I didn't say I, – I, I'm, I'm a jerk because I want to make sure I get their URL right. It is. It's hornfrogblitz.com. Yep. I want to make sure. I, I thought it was, but I also don't want to send like another website. Well, and that's always hornfrogblitz.com, part of the 24 7 sports uh, network. And uh, and yeah, so hornfrogblitz.com. <laughs> One of those things. Right. You say it out loud confidently and then go hornfrogblitz.com. Was that right? <laughs> well, and by the way, they've got a good podcast called The Frogcast if you're yeah. into that kind of thing too. So go ahead and check that out over there. Appreciate Jeremy Clark. We are Texas Football today. We're here every weekday at noon on texasfootball.com, talking football in the Lone Star State. You can follow us on Twitter at DCTF, like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Dave Campbell's. Follow us on Instagram, instagram.com slash Dave Campbell's. And of course, see us at texasfootball.com, texasfootball.com slash subscribe to become a Dave Campbell's Texas Football Insider. Get this bad boy mailed directly to you. Plus, exclusive online content, including you can see team previews of on team pages of every um, high school football team in the state. We've updated the website on their team pages. So if you go to the, give me a high school football team. Teague. Stop saying Teague. Give me another one. Manville. Manville. If you go to the Manville page on TexasFootball.com, <laughs> you can go scroll down if you're an insider and you can read the the expanded preview that we have in the magazine. Uh, you can read it online right now at TexasFootball.com. Makes a great gift as well. So celebrate the independence of your na- nation. Celebrate the birth of your nation by blowing up a small part of it by going to TexasFootball.com. Yes. Subscribe. And you can see the Teague preview too if you want. You can also see the Teague preview. There. Shout out Teague. We drove through there. We did. <laughs> yeah. Pickle, one place we also drove was College Station. For the state seven on seven tournament, um, down there last weekend, had a lot of fun talking with coaches. One of the great things is that coaches come in from all over the state, and they're not busy because they can't coach, so they can uh, get bothered by us. They have nothing better to do realistically than to have us annoy them. So Matt Step <laughs> caught up with uh, a coach from very far flung area of the state, uh, El Paso Americas coach Patrick Melton. Uh, here is Matt Step's conversation with the head coach at El Paso Americas, Patrick Melton, here on Texas Football Today. Matt Step, Dave Campbell's Texas Football on TexasFootball.com. Back here at the Texas State 7-on-7 State Tournament. Here at the head coach of the America's Trailblazers, all the way from the 915, Coach Patrick Melton. Coach, uh, welcome to State 7-on-7. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm running a little bit behind today, though. Yeah, well, tell us, tell us what happened. You, you, you're, you're back home because you're a Coppers Cove guy. I know you're a, you're a bulldog. You, you still got love for the Cove. Uh, so you're back in your old stomping grounds. What, what happened that made you run a little bit late? So I'm running around this morning seeing people doing things, and then I finally realized at the last minute that my, my car clock was still set to El Paso time. Yeah. So then I had to hustle and get down here. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Uh, now, we've talked o- offline, and you're not uh, – y- your team p- plays physical on Friday night. You like to get after it punch people in the mouth, play tough defense, run the football. 7-on-7 seven seven has not been your thing in the past. What, 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 what changed this year? What, what was the, the, the impetus for playing some 7-on-7 seven seven for you guys this year? Well, first and foremost, we're going to have a really young team. And, um, you know, our kids didn't get, compete this year. We only got three games. I've got, you know, like five so- going to be sophomores on this team that got to play three freshman games. So, really, they just needed to compete. So, we needed to find something to compete in. And, and secondly, you know, the UIL changing the rule about us being able to coach our kids, kind of get rid of that whole we don't coach our kids in seven-on-seven seven facade, and now we get to coach them up. So, you know, they get to go out and compete some and have some fun. Now, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're in a good pool. There's a lot of good teams. That's, that's one of the best parts about playing seven-on-seven. Seven. I know you, you were really happy that you guys are having some success. You're, you're in a pool playing some teams you don't usually play in. What are you looking to see out of your kids today uh, as far as uh, just the competition level? And what, is there anything specific you want to see from your guys? Really, I just want to see the young kids step up when, when the pressure gets turned on. I want to make sure that, you know, when the pressure is on, that they revert back to their fundamentals and don't get caught up in the limelight. All right, Coach. Now, uh, looking ahead to 20, 2021 season, 
District 16A is always tough. It's a deep district. You know, every you know anybody can beat anyone on on any given night. That's got. I know that, ma that makes it tough for you guys to prepare every week. W how do you see the district shaking out? Well, who do you think are the, are the teams that you guys are gonna have to beat if you want to keep keep that standard of success? I think the the easy favorites obviously are gonna be Franklin and Eastwood, and then after that, I mean, everybody else really is kind of in the same boat. We're gonna be really young, but you know, we usually do really well in district because of the style of football that we play. So, you know, really, we think we're one of the playoff teams in in, in a rebuilding year. So. I think that's how it's going to shake out. Now I'm going to ask you about the hat. That that is a sweet looking ball cap. I know America's plays good baseball over there on, in the Socorro ISD district. Uh, did your baseball coach hook you up with that hat? That's a pretty sweet gig. Yes, he did. He takes care of me every year. They usually have about three hats a year, and he usually takes care of me. So I try to rep him whenever I can. He's one. He's one of the best coaches around. You know, my baseball coach and my basketball coach really keep me honest. I'm I'm number three in our in our school. I got you. <laughs> all right, all right. Now you're back in your own stopping grounds. You're. Our, our own Ashley Pickle is a fan of this place. Tell us about Storms and Lampasas. Is that, is that a must stop when you go to, when you go go home to Copper's Cove? Oh, absolutely. When we come back through, we got to hit Storms. That's the last little, get that little snack right before you get to the house. All right, final question. Now, the, the DCTF crew is coming out to El Paso this year to cover some games. It's a good chance one of us comes to that game against Del Valle um, in week uh, three, I believe. Uh, so are, are you cooking out or do we need to grab some, something to eat in town? Where, where are we going? I mean, if you want me to cook, I'll cook. We'll do that. I had a smoker going. There you go. Coach, appreciate your time. Enjoy watching your kids compete, and it's good to see you. Appreciate you. There he is, Patrick Melton, the head coach of the El Paso Americas Trailblazers. Right? Trailblazers? Oh no, I'm I'm really doubting myself today. Yeah, you're you're coming in hot and then automatically per like pulling it off. The no, burner. I'm right. It's Trailblazers. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's Wait. still yes, checking. Yes, I got it. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. There's this really cool website. It's uh, TexasFootball.com. That's where I went. Uh, anyway, they have mascots. Um, and here's the <laughs> other thing about Patrick Melton. Here's the other thing about Patrick Melton. Patrick Melton, that's a tall man. Dude, he made Very like the moment Matt that Step is a big dude. Yeah, and he made Step look like little. Matt Step's probably six three, six four. Yeah, I think Step, if you're six, in the comments, let us know how tall you are. I think six three. Six three or six four. And Patrick Melton's like dunking on this dude. Yeah, it looked like Step was a little kid with his big hat. Yeah. You know, like he's got the big hat. <laughs> hey, does coach. It. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> Good to see ya. Anyway, appreciate six Patrick two, Melton. Six two, he said. Six two. He's shrinking. Yes. It's it's the, that's a conversion rate to Canada. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, he's actually like that's like four and a half meters. Uh, anyway, we appreciate Patrick Melton from El Paso, America. He's got one more interview for you because I had the great pleasure of catching up with the head coach of the Wink Wildcats. Yeah, alliteration. Coach Brian Gibson uh, talked with him watch as he was watching his boys go out there, and I mean that, I mean that sin like legitimately watching his, his boys, boys, including yeah. his boy. Going out there playing. Uh, here's um, my conversation with Wink coach Brian Gibson here on Texas Football Today. Greg Tepper of Dave Campbell's Texas Football and TexasFootball.com here in College Station at the State 7-on-7 tournament. I'm here with the head coach of the Wink Wildcats. That's Coach Brian Gibson. Coach, first and foremost, thanks for your time. I, I like asking the question, what what do you do here? Do you feel a little powerless since you can't go out there and coach your boys? Yeah, it is. It is. It's hard. It's hard to sit there and watch them and not say anything. Um, but everyone kind of throws a hand out there, here, there, kind of coaches them a little bit. But I, really, this is just a time for us to enjoy our kids and let them uh, go out and have fun and compete, um, build a little bit of team um, atmosphere together and learn how to lead themselves. So. So, so, so what do you want to see from your guys out here? They're out here competing. What, what, what would make you feel better going into the fall seeing from them? I just want to see how, how they're going to compete. I want to see how they're going to do in adverse situations. Uh, you know, this is coming out here and the humidity is not what we're accustomed to. Um, you know, there's obviously different talent out this way. And so I just want to see how they're going to handle that stuff. And in situations whenever – um, it's not going their way. How are they going to come together as a team and uh, build off of that? Well, let's talk a little bit about your 2021 squad. Last year, a 10-win team. Uh, you know, things looked in, trending in the right direction. Ran into a really good Wellington team in the playoffs. Uh, we've got high hopes for for your for your Wildcats in, in 2021. That, it, is it fair to say you share those high hopes as well? Uh, yes, we do. We uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, we lost a tremendous senior class. Um, lots of great players in that class, but we've also got some young guys that learn from them. Um, there's a lot to be said about that. Uh, well, I think we're going to be really strong up front. Our offensive line and defensive line should be pretty solid this year. Um, it's always nice to return a quarterback when you have uh, somebody come back with some experience. And two years 
of experience. That's going to be really good. We've got some really talented receivers. We just need to develop somebody that can carry the ball consistently, um, which I, th I think we've got some good options. And so, and I think we'll have some learning curves defensively. But I think we're going to be, uh, I think we're going to be pretty good. You guys got a quarterback though, right? We do have a quarterback. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Are you, are you, you're, are you familiar with his work a little bit? Yeah, I am. Cannon I am, Gibson. I am. I am familiar with his work. Uh, we've we've gone to a lot of camps this summer. He's we we've gone all across the state. We come down this part. We've gone up north. We've gone everywhere, um, and it's been fun watching him grow and compete. And uh, he's learning from different people, different coaches, different kids on the field. And so it's really done him well this year. He's done a lot of good and. I'm uh, really looking for big things from him next year. So what does, you know, talk about your, your son, the quarterback. I, I want to ask you a little bit about the the, the, the dynamics of the, the coach and quarterback dynamic. You, you've had great quarterbacks in the past, maybe not your son, you know, as far as having a quarterback out there. What What's that dynamic like between dad and, 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 and son as well as coach and quarterback? It's hard. Um, I, I've always been really hard on my quarterbacks. You ask any of the quarterbacks I've coached in the past, um, you know, I, I'm trying to put them through the test early. Um, I'm going to see how they're going to react. And so he's seen that growing up. He's been standing next to me as a ball boy growing up. So he knew when he was stepping in that role what he was getting into. Um, I asked the question before he kind of got into high school. I said, you sure this is what you want to do? Um, and he's dead set on it. He loves it. And so uh, it is. It's different. It's a hard dynamic because I'm very hard on both of my kids when I was they were playing for me because I expected them to be perfect because I didn't want them to be the one to let the team down. Um, wasn't fair to them on that, but it is what it is as a coach's kid. And so I think that's amplified even more when it's your son as a quarterback. Now, how far was the drive from, from Wink, just west of Midland, Odessa? Uh, here? We went, it's, it's a good eight hours, um, seven and a half if you just go nonstop, but eight hours with your stops and, you know, miscellaneous things that you got to do. How did, how did the kids handle the road trip? I think they handled it well. They were excited about it. Um, I, they all got in the room last night, and I think they were all asleep by 11 o'clock. <laughs> I didn't have any knocks on the door saying, you know, hey, need to calm this room down. So I think they were good. Um, I think they've handled it well. I think they're very excited about the opportunity to compete today. Coach, appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. There he is, Brian Gibson, the head coach of the Wink Wildcats, joining us out there at State 7-on-7, seven seven, uh, the number nine team to start the year in 2A Division II. Um, excited to see what they do in, in, in a difficult region. You know, mm -hmm. Wellington, probably the king of that region. But, you know, Stratford's tough. Vegas tough. McKamey's tough. Got to see quite a few of those teams. Um, McKamey's in their own district. Mm -hmm. 1, 2, 8, 2. Yeah, I think. Anyway, I uh, appreciate uh, him talking about his uh, his quarterback, too, who I I hear is pretty good. I hear he has good bloodlines. Yeah. Anyway, we appreciate I think he knows uh, him pretty well. Brian Gibson chatting with us. Let's go over to Ashley Pickle. To America's second for America's second favorite segment, final thoughts as you're holding up the sign behind you. It's gonna fall now. Oh, it almost did. It thought about it. It's sentient. Please don't. Um, for my final thoughts, Step made a great point as to what they should, what people should celebrate by getting a Dave Campbell subscription. It's hmm. Canada Day. It Today is Canada is Day. Like, like if you pull up your iPhone and you open up your calendar, mm -hmm. it will say Canada Day on there. That's right. It is Canada Day. So that really makes sense as to why Step had to get back. Yes. Like, because he could have just stayed until coaching school. But For I'm sure. sure the Canada Day festivities were calling his name, it's, even though he's in quarantine. It's going to be jumping up there. That's right. Yeah. Um, but so course, I, it'll I be hope jumping that <laughs> this weekend yeah. for America Day. Are is that what we're going to call it? Um, Fall now. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> That's going to do it for us. I hate it here. Thanks for spending <laughs> a little bit of your day with us. Follow us on Twitter at DCTF. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Dave Campbells. Follow us on Instagram, <laughs> instagram.com slash Dave Campbells. And, of course, see us at texasfootball.com. Thanks to Jeremy Clark of hornfrogblitz.com, to Patrick Melton of El Paso Americas, and to Brian Gibson of Wink for being our guests. For Ashley Pickle, I'm Greg Tepper. Vince Young, please meet your Player of the Year trophy. We'll see you tomorrow for Mailback Friday. Texas football today.